Hi, I'm Tim Tyler and today I'll be discussing popular misconceptions about memetics. Memetics is the name given to the study of cultural evolution by Richard Dawkins. It's one of the most misunderstood parts of Darwin's legacy and that's saying something. Unlike most misunderstandings of evolution, misunderstandings of memetics are common among ordinary scientists and biologists. Some are the results of missteps by the memetic pioneers. Some are the results of memetics being a relatively young and little known science. Some are the result of genuine conceptual difficulties with understanding the theory. Some are the reactions of established scientists who foresee a turf war in their own domain with memetics, and some are the products of ignorance and other human failings. This particular video will focus on misunderstandings of the whole concept of cultural evolution. Meme fitness depends on gene fitness. I remember when I first read The Selfish Gene I thought, ah, but if the memes are deleterious their host will die, so meme fitness actually boils down to gene fitness in practice. Dawkins correctly dismisses this view in the extended phenotype. Time and again my sociobiological colleagues have upbraided me as a turncoat because I will not agree with them that the ultimate criteria for the success of a meme must be its contribution to Darwinian fitness. At bottom, they insist, a good meme spreads because brains are receptive to it, and the receptiveness of brains is ultimately shaped by genetic natural selection. It is, of course, true that memes are utterly dependent upon genes, but genes can exist and change quite independently of memes. But this does not mean that the ultimate criteria for success in meme selection is gene survival. It does not mean that success goes to those memes that favour the genes of the individuals bearing them. To be sure, this will sometimes be so. Obviously a meme that causes the individuals bearing it to kill themselves has a grave disadvantage, but not necessarily a fatal one. Just as a gene for suicide sometimes spreads itself by a roundabout route, for example in social insect workers or parental sacrifice, so a suicidal meme can spread, as when a dramatic and well-publicised martyrdom inspires others to die for a deeply loved cause, and this in turn inspires others to die, and so on. One pathogen strategy is to use the host's resources as quickly as possible. That strategy can be seen in viruses such as Ebola. It doesn't need to benefit its host to spread, so it is with some memes. Another pathogen strategy is to sterilise the host and to divert its reproductive resources towards propagating the virus. A similar strategy can be seen in some priests who are sterilised by their memes. Culture doesn't evolve, it is designed. To start with, a soundbite from Elias Yadkowski. Someone says, technology evolves. Technology does not evolve, it is designed. There's a big difference between those two foundations of order. Next, I'll let Steven Pinker be the spokesperson for this one. Dawkins himself used the analogy to illustrate how natural selection pertains to anything that can replicate, not just DNA. Others treat it as a genuine theory of cultural evolution. Taken literally, it predicts that cultural evolution works like this. A meme impels its bearer to broadcast it, and it mutates in some recipient. A sound, a word, or a phrase is randomly altered. Perhaps, as in Monty Python's Life of Brian, the audience of the Sermon on the Mount mishears Blessed Other Peacemakers as Blessed Other Cheesemakers. The new version is more memorable and comes to predominate in the majority of minds. It too is mangled by typos and speakers and heroes, and the most spreadable ones accumulate, gradually transforming the sequence of sounds. Eventually they spell out, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. I think you'll agree that this is not how cultural change works. A complex meme does not arise from the retention of copying errors. It arises because some person knuckles down, racks his brain, musters his ingenuity, and composes it or writes or paints or invents something. Granted, the fabricator is influenced by ideas in the air and may polish draft after draft, but neither of these progressions is like natural selection. Just compare the input and output, draft 5 and draft 6, or an artist's inspiration with, with and her oeuvre. They do not differ by a few random substitutions. The value added with each iteration comes from focusing brain power on improving the product, not from retelling or recopying it hundreds of thousands of times in the hope that some of the malapros or typos will be useful. To a memeticist, such deliberate changes are a type of non-random mutation. Some of them are macro mutations, and they are certainly nowhere near as random as mutations of DNA usually are, but they are still mutations nonetheless. In no way does the non-randomness of mutations invalidate the basic idea of memetics. 
Also, St Stephen Pinker's reference to polishing draft after draft often refers to a process that may itself be strongly evolutionary in character. Frequently, if you dismantle such a mutation, you will find another iterative evolutionary process inside it. The analogy between memes and genes breaks down on close inspection. Here's Henrik Boyd and Richardson. Take the meme controversy. The disputants take the main issue to be whether culture is highly analogous to genes or not. If so, then their evolution is to be explained by fitness. If not, Darwinism is useless. If we are correct, this debate is an utter red herring. The proper approach is to recognise that the analogy between genes and culture is quite loose, and to build up a theory of cultural evolution that takes into account the actual properties of the cultural system. Now, memes are not merely analogous to genes. They are literally a type of gene. Memes are genes that are not made out of DNA. The relationship between mimetic evolution and nuclear evolution is not an analogy. They are both instances of replicated dynamics. In both cases you have inheritance, variation and selection. They are both instantiations of a Darwinian process. Yes, there are differences between mimetic and nuclear evolution, but the underlying Darwinian dynamics are identical. Evolution is poorly seen as being a composite of two different types of evolutionary process interacting with each other. Rather, it is one process operating on a system with multiple different types of replicator. Meme evolution is not part of biological evolution. This is a matter of definition. Biology is the study of life. Evolution is changes in heritable traits of a population over time. According to those definitions, cultural evolution is part of biological evolution. Nowhere in the definition of evolution does it say that inheritance must be via DNA. Nowhere in the definition of trait does it say that circumcised penises do not count. Meme is technobabble for concept. Here's Ernst Mayer in 1997. In neither his definition nor the examples illustrating what memes are does Dawkins mention anything that would distinguish memes from concepts. One good thing about the term meme is its link to the term gene, which immediately conjures up the intended association. The term concept does not do this. This association helps people to grasp the basic idea of cultural evolution. Memetics has little predictive power. Here's John Maynard Smith. My own suspicion is that these structural differences between culture and genetics will inevitably limit the usefulness of the kind of theory presented in this book. The explanatory power of evolutionary theory rests largely on three assumptions. That mutation is non-adaptive, that acquired characters are not inherited, and that inheritance is Mendelian, that is, it is atomic, and we inherit the atoms or genes equally from our two parents and from no one else. In the cultural analogy, none of these things is true. This must severely limit the ability of a theory of cultural inheritance to say what can happen, and more importantly, what cannot happen. It is curious to see the idea that randomness leads to predictability. The randomness of mutations introduces a significant quantity of noise into nuclear evolution, and that makes it harder for it to generate reliable predictions. To the extent that mutations in cultural evolution are less random, that makes its predictions less noisy and more likely to be accurate. It is true that there are likely to be more possible paths between any two points in design space if you are allowed to use the tools of cultural evolution to produce the intermediate variants. However, the additional power of cultural evolution means that an optimization process is more likely to converge on a desired target with a cultural rather than nuclear evolution, and so cultural evolution is more predictable. So, Maynard Smith doesn't exactly make a convincing case here. However, let us assume for a moment that his conclusion is true, and that it is harder to make predictions with cultural evolution rather than with biological evolution. So what? Theories of cultural evolution are not in competition with theories of biological evolution. They compete with other theories of cultural change that are less inspired by Darwinism. So, even if the conclusion was true, the objection is not a pertinent one. Human culture is not alive. I don't see how someone can subscribe to memetics and fail to take seriously the section in The Selfish Gene where Nicholas Humphrey is quoted as saying, Memes should be regarded as living structures not just metaphorically, but technically. For most people, the idea that all human culture is alive represents a radical redefinition of what it means to be alive. However, it is a central idea of memetics, and taking the idea seriously leads to many of its important insights. Take Linux, for example. Where is its genotype? What does its phenotype look like? What resources does it take in? What waste does it spit out? 
or is it a predator on? What predates on it? What do its parasites look like? Does it act like a parasite itself? Where are its ancestral influences? Does it have a split between germ and soma? Where are its sensors? Where are its actuators? Where does its metabolism take place? Who are its mutual symbionts? What error correction mechanisms does it use to preserve its genome? Does it have an immune system? Without regarding Linux as being alive, these types of questions do not make much sense. Memes are not genes. This is a matter of definition. If you adopt a definition of gene based on information theory, then memes usually are a subset of genes. You often hear people contrasting memes and genes, as though the term gene referred to nucleic acid replicator. From the information theory perspective, that is loose talk. It would be very bad to have a definition of gene that excluded early organisms, aliens and synthetic life. Here ends my list of memetic misunderstandings. Enjoy!